This webinar is aiming to celebrate and promote uh, work workforce diversity by shining a spotlight on inspirational female role models working within the engineering sector. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, so please, as we listen to our speakers, do think about those questions. Let us know if you have any questions as we move through, mm -hmm. and we will take questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Okay, next slide, please. So my name's Claire, I'm Head of Products and Services here at WISE, and I'm going to be facilitating the webinar today and introducing our amazing three speakers. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping points, really. Um, if I could ask you to stay muted throughout the webinar. Um, if your audio isn't working, you can dial in using the phone call option in the side panel. And as I mentioned, we will be taking questions today on the webinar. So if you have any questions, please do use the question function in the side panel throughout to ask any of those questions of our speakers as we move through. Next slide, please. Just a quick introduction to WISE. So who are WISE? WISE um, are a charitable organisation. We, uh, we raise uh, awareness of women working in STEM and engineering careers and we work with a number of our members and organisations to help them to improve diversity and inclusion within their organisations. We do this with insight and knowledge. We have knowledge sharing events. We have a huge amount of case studies and best practices on our website for our members. We collaborate with members on projects and, and, uh, and exciting um, opportunities to try and showcase and, uh, and, and promote role models and champions of gender balance throughout the UK. And we have, as today, a number of inspirational events for our members and as today for, uh, for non-members as well to try and promote the exciting opportunities you can have with a engineering career. Um, in, and, uh, and the opportunities for these people. So today's um, webinar, we're going to uh, be talking to three amazing women with a wide variety of backgrounds and engineering roles and a wide variety of organisations they're working in. They're going to be sharing their experiences of engineering career opportunities and the best practice that they've, they've obtained through moving through their careers. And as I say at the end, we are going to be having a question an answer session on how we can do more to attract and develop and sustain women within these engineering and technological roles. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Okay, I'm delighted to begin by introducing Group Captain Liz O'Sullivan. Group Captain O'Sullivan achieved a master's degree in engineering, manufacturing and management from the University of Birmingham. She joined the RAF in 2003 as an Aero Systems Engineering Officer and was recently promoted to Rolls-Royce and secondment in October 2021 as Vice President UK Strategy within the Rolls-Royce Defence Business Development Team. We're now going to hear more from Group Captain O'Sullivan about her early career and experiences working in the RAF. Liz, I'm delighted to hand over to you. Thank you, Claire. Um, so good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to speak to you today about um, becoming an engineer in the Royal Air Force. Um, I've split the presentation uh, into three parts. I'm going to start with why and how I became uh, an engineer in the Air Force. I'm then going to give you a summary of some of my career highlights. Um, then I'm going to talk about some of the best bits uh, and equally some of the challenges. Um, so starting why engineering for me and, and specifically the RAF. Um, well, at school, I was always better than, at numbers. Um, I found the logic in it. Being very dyslexic, um, I struggled with some of the language subjects, uh, specifically English. I'm also super nosy, um, so I like to know how things work. So for me, I definitely had this affinity towards science and science subjects. So it was unsurprising then uh, after my GCSEs, of which I did single science, um, I chose to study maths, physics, chemistry and AS uh, further maths uh, at A level um, before moving to university and studying mechanical engineering, manufacturing and management at the University of Birmingham. And I think I chose that particular um, degree um, because of its diversity. It wasn't all uh, mechanical engineering, uh, but equally, I knew that that gave me a broad range of opportunities as a mechanical engineer, uh, whatever I chose to go into in the future. 
Uh, whilst at university, I completed placements at uh, British Steel, uh, the former British Steel as it was then, um, building and working on a filtration system, um, and also at Rolls-Royce working with the fuel cell technology. And I think for me, moving into my final year, um, whilst I loved both of my placements, and it was great to put into practice the academics that I was learning as part of my degree, I felt that I probably wanted a little bit more from a career. Um, and seeing all my friends have an amazing time in the University Air Squadron, uh, that's specifically why I then chose to join the Air Force as an Air Systems Engineer. Um, so I got the best of both worlds. I was able to apply my engineering in a tangible way to see uh, real output. Uh, and equally, I got all the opportunities uh, that came with being in the RAF, so travel, sport, a bit more of which I'll, I'll talk about later. And so what I do in uh, the RAF, so I am an aerosystems systems engineer, so I want to work with all the high tech uh, cutting edge technology um, and across all of the systems. So there are listed armaments, avionics, propulsions um, across all different types uh, of aircraft and ground support equipment as well. Um, also uh, within the RAF, I've had an opportunity to do perhaps less traditional engineering roles, um, but all that have used my skill set from being an engineer. Um, examples include uh, within a facilitating education role or uh, equally working within program management or uh, general management of the business. So we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so what has my career been like uh, in the RAF and, and how did I get to be a Greek captain now and in my current role seconded uh, to Rolls-Royce? Well, in the RAF, I have moved roles roughly every two to three years. Um, so I've always had a fresh challenge and I've loved all the appointments that I've done um, all for different reasons uh, and that have happened at different times, uh, at different times in my life. Um, so. I've loved my frontline tours, which are the really practical ones um, based at a squadron on an RAF base. Um, so I've started as a junior engineering officer uh, working with fast jets on uh, Jaguar aircraft. I did a senior engineering officer appointment. So uh, the senior engineer on the squadron responsible for TriStar aircraft. So they conduct air to air refueling and air mobility activities. And then finally, my most recent uh, role prior to promotion, uh, I was OC engineering and logistics wing at RAF Bryson Norton, which looks after all of the air mobility fleet. Um, there I was the chief air engineer uh, responsible for uh, the aircraft you see there, so a Voyager, C-130, A-400 and C-17, as well as airborne equipment as well, so, so parachuting. Um, an amazing role, super, super hard in, in many ways, um, but I had an absolutely fantastic team. Um, no Tuesdays the same, responsible for about 650 people, um, but more broadly influencing about a thousand engineers in some way in terms of uh, offering them uh, authorizations and, and assessing them for that. Um, and that's across the whole workforce as well. So not just military personnel, that's also civil servants uh, and industry contractors um, as well. Um, great role in terms of the operational output. Uh, I happened to do that over COVID when we were doing quite a lot of COVID vaccination uh, transportation um, and medevacs, uh, so bringing people to ventilators uh, uh, on the UK mainland um, and also uh, more latterly towards the end of my tour uh, involved in the uh, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan under Operation Pitting. I've also done a number of staff roles. So staff roles tend to be those that are more, I would consider more desk bound, um, perhaps more planning related. Uh, I've worked with Typhoon, um, was heavily involved in doing some planning and contractual work for Operation Elemy, which was part of the Libya campaign. Um, and also responsible for the Battle of Britain Memorial flight while I was there as well. So looking after them, some of their displays. Um, also on promotion to wing commander, I worked uh, in the as the Typhoon system integration head. Um, that was specifically looking about capability planning, program management, um, but also I was the lead national awareness representative in the four nations that are part of the Typhoon program. Uh, and I had the lead for avionics and weapon systems um, in that respect. I did a brief stint at the Military Aviation Authority, um, looking at airworthiness in a broader sense from a regulator perspective, um, but 
that was just prior to, to, to moving to Rolls Royce. And like I said, I've also done out of branch appointments. So I was staff officer to the chief of the air staff uh, as a flight lieutenant, which meant I got an amazing view of how the high levels of defence work. I was also facilitating, facilitating master's education on the advanced command and staff course, which I attended as a student and then went back to teach. And now in my current role, I'm seconded uh, into Rolls Royce. So I'm still a serving group captain uh, in the Air Force, but I work within the Rolls Royce business development team. And I'm involved in anything from uh, looking at synthetic aviation fuel, um, providing a customer uh, perspective about sustainability in terms of operational advantage or energy resilience um, and I'm also looking at novel nuclear uh, capabilities uh, all the way through to looking at writing uh, and supporting writing their space propulsion strategy so a massive huge diversity digital set. We can move to the next slide please Anna. So I guess it really leads me on to what the best fit and some of the challenges that I may have uh, faced um, so from the word go in the RAF, you're given bags of responsibility as an engineer. Um, you're responsible for the air awareness in some way of multi-million pounds worth of equipment, aircraft and supporting ground equipment. And it's quite easy to be daunted. Um, but I have to say, you know, I've been given a fantastic education and um, worked with Ta hugely talented individuals um, and you're able to, to, to get through that collectively as a team um, and also you get to see the end result on a day-to-day -day basis so I am responsible for um, fundamentally supporting that operational output um, so in terms of new two days the same one time I could be working on an engine issue on an A400M aircraft next I could be looking about whether it's safe to fly aircraft because of a potential fuel contamination issue all the way through to um, a parachute not uh, uh, operating as it as it possibly can and and I've also mentioned some of those operational impacts so for example um, A400M and an engine issue um, heavily involved uh, in Operation Pitting the draw from Afghanistan and equally in, in Typhoon um, looking at the aircraft intercepting aircraft uh, foreign aircraft as they move into UK airspace Responsibility in terms of people, I often say it's the greatest privilege to be able to lead uh, the people that I have uh, have during my career, but equally it's probably the greatest responsibility as well. Uh, responsible for, for their development uh, and their understanding uh, and their career progression as well. So the smallest team I've probably worked with is around about 20 people uh, and like I say up to 650 but the influence that you have is far broader in that respect um, and the final bit I'd probably pick out there is finance um, I kind of brought that um, with the airworthiness responsibility that I have from an aircraft perspective but it's also uh, program management uh, and managing budgets um, and for example managing a training budget uh, in latter roles um, in terms of variety, I've already touched on diversity. It's been really clear, as you've probably seen in my previous slide. Um, but I've managed to work all over the UK um, uh, just in my my day to day roles um, in terms of moving every two to three years. Um, that equally can be a bit of a challenge and um, I've hugely enjoyed it um, but now I have a nearly nine-year-old and a husband who's also serving um, in the RAF so trying to balance us all being in the right place at the right time and making sure that I get that work-life balance right and um, has been difficult but um, the Air Force have let me have um, that choice in terms of the career decisions that I've made at, at each stage and the opportunities are huge. Um, and I wouldn't say that's just opportunities um, in the Royal Air Force, but opportunities as an engineer uh, in terms of the diverse set of fields that you can work in and the skill set that you obtain as an engineer that you can apply in all uh, areas uh, and, and different careers. Um, I've just had the added perks uh, that come with the Royal Air Force in terms of traveling all over the world. Uh, I've worked in all continents, but uh, sadly the Antarctic. I've been to some really nice places. I've been to some not so nice places um, in some of the operational contexts. Um, but at each time I felt that I've been provided 
um, with the equipment and skills that I need to succeed in my role. The education and training that I've had has been first class and I've been actively um, encouraged to invest in myself as well as invest in others. Um, sports opportunities, amazing. I learned to ski in the RAF. Um, and really, it's some of the experiences that I've had that I couldn't replicate anywhere else. So whether it's flying in a fast jet or a picture of me there flying uh, in a Lancaster, meeting royalty and um, working with um, technology that I couldn't necessarily have dreamed of, or just simply, like I say, working in the locations that I've had. And probably the greatest thing that I found uh, about working in the RAF is, uh, and as an engineer specifically, is the hugely gifted and talented people um, that I've worked with me. And um, there's a picture there on the right, particularly fitting for um, uh, at Women in Engineering Day is that I happen to have an entirely female second line management at RAF Bryce Norton. Um, and so I guess in sum, because um, I've talked too long, um, what advice would I give you um, as budding future engineers? Um, I, I, I've summed it up into three points there. Absolutely be authentic, be yourself. I have chosen a career in engineering and specifically within the RAF um, because it was about being true to myself, my values and what I enjoyed. And there's often a feeling, I think, sometimes from female engineers that they have perhaps in a male dominated environment that you have to be more masculine in your approach or, or traditionally what we considered masculine in your approach. That certainly hasn't been the case throughout my uh, my career, and it's absolutely imperative that as a leader that you're authentic in the way that you you progress. And I'd also talk about being curious. Um, we live in a massively ever changing world, and I'm not just talking about that from a technology perspective, but also the environment. Uh, and a classic would be in terms of the work that I'm doing currently with sustainability, uh, looking after the planet, um, and things change. And it's also looking at the international environment but I'd also say be curious about your people and the people um, that work for you uh, and help them achieve their full potential uh, not least uh, as individuals but also within the engineering environment and the final one I'd say is be determined um, it hasn't always been easy in the role that I've done um, there's been some pretty hard times but ultimately um, they've been hugely rewarding and I'd say if you follow what you enjoy what inspires you uh, and links to your values um, that inevitably follow your dreams and you will be successful thanks Claire that's me done brilliant thank you so much Liz Okay, if you've got any questions for Liz, then uh, please do put them into the questions section and we'll address those at the end and uh, have an overall discussion right at the end of the uh, webinar. That was a great presentation. I've learned a lot there about the RAF. Okay, our next uh, speaker is Ruth and I'm very excited to introduce Ruth. Ruth graduated from the University of Surrey in 2020 with a master's degree in civil engineering and since then she's been working for Bam Nuttall as the first international member of Royal Ban Group's graduate programme, which is going to be interesting to hear about. Ruth is going to tell us about her work in BAM and her voluntary work with the Institution of Civil Engineers and how she volunteers as STEM ambassador. So Ruth, over to you. Great, thanks Claire. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, yeah, as it says on the screen, I'm Ruth Marsden and currently work for BAM Nuttall. Um, today I'm going to kind of talk you through what got me into civil engineering, my education, what I've done so far and then touch on kind of what's coming next and what else I do outside of the day job. So as you can see there from that brilliant photo of me aged very nearly four, um, I've always been interested in construction, it's always been kind of um, inspiring to me and that's actually part of a home video that goes on for ages of me wearing a hard hat and safety goggles um, so it's always been around my life from when I was a young age um, but then growing up I enjoyed maths as I think most engineers tend to but I also wanted the ability to create something tangible that would improve local communities but also improve the planet and when I was looking at university courses, civil engineering was the one that seemed to tick 
all of those boxes for me and give me the most opportunities to really do that in a way that I'd be able to to measure and look back on at the end of my career and say I built that this is what I did this is how it helped these people um so civil engineering is is where I've been um next slide please Hannah so I thought I'd just touch on my education because while I've had a relatively linear traditional education path, the subjects I've studied have actually not been um, standard or traditional for engineers. So when I did my GCSEs, obviously did the core subjects, so your maths, your English and your science. Um, but I also took art, geography and two languages which I really enjoyed and gave me a good breadth of kind of knowledge and understanding. Moving on to A-levels, I took maths, physics, geography and English literature and language. Now, most engineers tend to do more science based um, A-levels. I was lucky in the universities accepted geography as a science, um, so I could um, use that on my UCAS application but I've really found that English has actually been a big positive to my career um, I really enjoyed it I wasn't going to stop doing it just because I wanted to do engineering but it's given me that ability to communicate effectively and concisely but also write reports um, a lot of my friends at university had no idea how to structure a report and I was able to support them through that um, and then in 2015, I joined the University of Surrey um, doing a integrated master's in civil engineering. So that was a five year course, including a placement year. Um, I did my placement year with a consulting company called Atkins. And I was also lucky enough to be sponsored by them through my degree as part of a scholarship scheme that Surrey run in collaboration with the Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, as you can see on the right, these are some photos of me through the ages. Uh, the bottom three are at university. So the first one shows a bridge project we had to do in first year, which looking back on now is severely over-engineered, but at the time we had no idea whether it would hold up or not. And then the next one down of us in our gorgeous high vis is about a design assemble and disassemble project we did as part of a team. And then obviously graduation, which although I graduated in the midst of the pandemic, I did still manage to get a ceremony in 2021. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. So my engineering career technically started back in 2013 when I did two weeks of work experience, one with Foster and Partners, who are an architect um, and I was looking at kind of water um, drainage systems and creating infographics and stuff for the team. And then I did a week with ACOM, who are a large engineering consultancy that was based in the Paris office. Um, and I was looking at chemical, um, it was benzene levels in a small uh, community in the north of France. So that was quite interesting and showed me the breadth that civil engineering covers um, and really enjoyed them. That was before I even went to sixth form to do A-levels. Then, as I mentioned, I did my placement year with Atkins. Um, for this year, I was in the airports team. So I spent the time looking at refurbishments and rehabilitation of the runway and taxiways at Gatwick Airport. Um, one of my highlights of this year was standing on the middle of the Gatwick runway at three o'clock in the morning, digging holes in it um, to test the pavement strength. Um, through this year, I also introduced a digital app to the team that we used for um, inspections. So instead of going on site with sheets and sheets of paper and trying to match your location to where you actually were on this piece of paper and then take photos and reference it, it was a very um, archaic way 
this app used GPS and you just did it all live, you could access it immediately in the office. It was brilliant. So that was a really good year, I really enjoyed it. That's also when I first registered as a STEM ambassador, first got involved. Then went back to uni, did my final two years um, midst of the pandemic. So unfortunately, Atkins did not take graduates on in 2020. So I found myself at a bit of a, um, a loss of what to do with my life. And so I was applying for jobs and got contacted by someone at BAM saying that they run this design management traineeship, it's called, um, in the Netherlands. So BAM is a Dutch company and they were looking to expand it into the UK. And would I like to be the first English person to do this scheme? Obviously, I said yes. Um, so the kind of crux of this scheme is four six month long rotations with each rotation being in a different part of the business. So you can experience everything that BAM do and then take that into your career to kind of provide a more holistic idea of the company and how we could improve, collaborate, work together. Um, so there's also some additional things you get to do with this, such as personal development. Um, you get to communicate with senior leaders in the business. Um, you get opportunities to kind of participate in restructuring and questions like that. Uh, so they really value us as trainees. It has obviously had some hurdles being the only UK person, but by and large, it's been interesting. My first six months were spent at EKFB, who are a joint venture of which BAM is the B, um, building the middle 80 kilometers of high speed two. I was doing design optimization, so working with the design team to see where we could save the project money. Uh, specifically looking at public rights of way and instrumentation and monitoring. I was writing reports on this, managing stakeholders, um, communicating between people all over the world to try and get the information I needed. I then moved to Tenderdesk, which operates at BAM group level. So based in the Netherlands, unfortunately, still the pandemic. So I was working from home. Um, and what I was doing there was assessing and reviewing projects that BAM want to bid for um, and seeing whether they fit into our risk profile. So whether they were too expensive, whether we'd make enough money from them, whether they were parts of the industry that we had experience in, um, whether they were kind of with a good project team, a good client. So I was doing that for projects based all over Europe, um, also presented a couple of tenders myself to the chief operating officer in the UK and the chief operating officer for the Netherlands, which was terrifying um, the first time I did it, but quickly became kind of more business as usual. Last October, I then moved to the UK and Ireland transformation team. So BAM decided to restructure from three separate companies in the UK to one division, the UK and Ireland, with these three companies underneath it, but aligning them in terms of strategic initiatives and uh, back office functions, so legal, HR, etc. And I was managing the delivery of 18 of these strategic projects. So we were looking at things such as sustainability and social impact, um, innovation, so modular construction um, and things like that. It was a lot of work, very different to what I'd done before, uh, but I really enjoyed it. And finally, um, I am nearly two months into my final rotation uh, with BAM Properties. So we are actually client side. Um, so we work as the client and employ BAM as our contractor on office developments. So again, I'm helping with the management of three different projects, all at various stages of delivery. Um, but I'm also getting involved with a project we have at the moment to bring our modular residential capacity into the UK. So we are developing 
modular residential offerings and then we're going to find a site to do some initial uh, experiments, costing, learning with. So again, very, very different, very, very interesting, massively steep learning curve, but I'm really enjoying it. So next slide, please, Hannah. Engineering for me is not just a day job. Um, I will try and speed through this because I'm aware of the time. Um, when I was at university, I joined two engineering societies because one just wasn't enough. So I was on the Civil Engineering Society for three out of my five years and then joined the Women in Engineering Society in my final year. As part of this, I was able to go to the WES conference, which was really exciting and gave me a great opportunity to meet other motivated female engineers from around the country. Um, as Claire mentioned, I've been a STEM ambassador since 2018. Um, so as part of this, I do school sessions. So I've been into a school to talk about uh, flotation and buoyancy with the students. I have judged a few competitions. I sit on various talks and panels. I'm also heavily involved with the ICE, the Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, so I'm on four committees for that at the moment, which range from being based regionally down in Southeast England, where I'm from, to national panels. Um, I go on site visits as often as I can get myself onto. So there are some pictures there. Uh, the bottom right is me on a site visit to a rail project in London, where BAM were refurbishing a bridge near Victoria. And then in the middle at the bottom is actually maybe showing just how um, in depth I am into engineering. I went on a three week road trip around Europe, stemmed from the idea of driving over the Miao Viaduct, which is in South France and the tallest bridge in the world. And I absolutely loved it. So I kind of um, extend engineering into my everyday life, my friends, take the mickey out of me for it, left, right and centre, but it's just who I am. Um, and then obviously I go to topic and project talks just to maintain that continuing learning and professional development. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. So what's next for me? Obviously, I will finish my traineeship in October, November time. So I have to find my permanent role. I am looking to go back to HS2, where I did my first rotation in a project slash design management role, um, because that's what I've enjoyed the most. Um, obviously, in my career, the next step is to get chartered, which is kind of the next big thing after graduation for civil engineers. Um, I see wise, I'm going to be stepping up to some slightly more senior roles within the various committees that I'm in. And then BAM have actually uh, recommended and are going to be sponsoring me through a senior leadership apprenticeship at Cranfield University, which will take another two or three years, um, but will give me a further MSc. And next slide, please, Hannah. And finally, um, my top tips, obviously I'm still relatively new to the industry, but I like to think I've been quite involved with it. So there are kind of four key things that I think are really important. The first is say yes. If it interests you, if it sounds exciting, even if it sounds terrifying, just say yes to it because people will support you, people will help you, and you never know, you might find your future career, your passion, just by saying yes and getting involved. Second, ask questions. There is really, honestly, I know it's cliche, but there is no such thing as a stupid question. People are more than happy to help out, explain what they know, share knowledge across the industry and across the different levels of a company. But similarly, share your thoughts. We are the future of the industry and we have a different perspective on things. So if we think that something could be improved or changed, share what you're thinking and more often than less, it will be considered. Uh, whether it's taken forward, whether it's feasible is a different thing, but it will be considered and thought about. And finally, as, as Liz touched on, follow your interests. You know, this industry is so broad. 
that there is something for everyone in it, whether you like getting knee deep in maths and coding or whether you like being out on site looking at a bridge structure, there is something for everyone. So do what you love within it and you will find something. That's all from me. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was a really good talk again. And as you can hear, we've already had two speakers from very different backgrounds, very different uh, sectors. And so it's, it's fascinating to hear just how broad and, and varied an engineering career can be these days. So should you have any questions for Ruth, again, please do ask them in the questions section in the software and we will address them at the end in the overall discussion. And then finally, our final speaker for today, I'm delighted to introduce Amy Bloom. Amy is an Assistant Technical Plant Manager for Sewers UK. She's following work in account management and a consultancy, and she's currently working as part of the technical engineering team. We're really looking forward to hearing from more from Amy about her career and the exciting opportunities she's had, including, I believe, virtual visits to the Arctic with X Expedition. So we're really looking forward to hearing more about that. Amy, over to you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm Amy. And I remember when I was sitting where you guys are sitting in the audience and I'm just reflecting on where the last few years have gone. They've gone very quickly for me. And so I'm going to give you just a quick overview to Suez, who I currently work for. My background um, in a similar ilk to the other ladies today and um, some of my best, best tips and advice. So about Suez, if you haven't heard about us, we are Suez UK. We work in re waste and resource management um, with over 150 years of experience. Now our roots are based in the construction of the Suez Canal, uh, which is where we got our name from. And at the moment in the UK, we have around 6,000 employees at around 300 sites. So that can be anaerobic digestion, which is a way to process food waste, and energy from waste sites, transfer stations, office, offices, you name it. What we do is we are pioneering sustainable solutions and innovative technologies for the UK's circular economy, both for businesses and local authorities. If you would like to keep up with what we are doing, uh, we have a Putting Waste to Good Use blog, which I recommend you have a look at. Next slide, please. So who am I? Why how have I got to this point? <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so I in a similar ilk, I loved um, maths at school. Um, so I studied chemistry, biology, maths, A-level, and took an AS in French because I love traveling and I love being able to communicate um, when I go abroad. So I uh, did that at uni, at, sorry, at school, but my didn't have a set career path. Um, my school had a... Um, had a day for different career topics and one of them was a chemical engineer. I got talking to him um, because he had chem in his job title. I'd never heard of chemical engineering before and I thought um, it might be a path to look at. He offered me work experience at his company, which was a company that looked at building inserts for heat exchangers to increase uh, turbidity in the flow. Um, and it turned out that I quite enjoyed this chemical engineering and I thought I would go forward and apply to it at university. I applied to Aston University and was successful in getting in. And what I loved about chemical engineering was it became a degree that really could lead you anywhere. I wasn't, and I find that with a lot of different types of engineering, you're not, um, you're actually just broadening your horizons by studying it. So I did five years at Aston University uh, with a sandwich year, a year in a pilot plant in um, pharmaceutical manufacturing for Sanofi. So that was down in Suffolk. And it was in my, it was at the end of my third year, so at the end of my sandwich year that I really fell in love with engineering, being hands-on and the possibilities of where this this path I was on could take me. Um, like I said, I did a master's research project as part of my degree, so I stuck on it in Emmend, and I did mine at the uh, EBRI, so that's the European Bio uh, Research Institute, Bioenergy Research Institute, 
and I looked at how we could transfer um, wastes into an oil and then use that oil to power large marine vessels such as cargo ships, ferries. Um, ultimately, my research project found that the way that I was looking at it wasn't um, feasible for long-term journeys, but this was my first taste of waste being a resource in the wrong place and how much value there is in what we throw away. So I've got a couple of photos there, so that's every at the top, but there's also me looking very pale, very tired, but handing in my research project, um, and there I am on graduation. Next slide, please. At university, I um, I happened to bump into um, a lady at a Women in STEM day who worked for Suez. And I was talking to her about my master's research project, about my love for the environment, because that is what drives me. I, I can't just every day I am driven by, I want the world and the environment to be better protected than it was. And she said they were hiring, and why didn't I apply? I um, so why, why not? Um, I'm a big proponent of lean in, um, which I think the other two ladies kind of touched upon, um, which is I didn't really, um, had never planned, never heard of the waste management sector before I, I met my, uh, my, man, my future manager, um, but it sounded fascinating, so I thought I would give it a go. And to be honest, I've been in it four years now and I have never looked back. I started out in key account management, so I looked at um, contract management for manufacturing customers. Now this was a very broad ranging job, but not in the engineering field. And but I found my technical and um, understanding and my analytical skills be incredibly useful in this role. Um, this role covered education. So there's, there I am at a, a, a show I was doing to help customers learn about recycling. It also involved uh, waste, hazardous waste management and very cool stuff as well. I got a tour of the Yorkshire Tea Factory up in Harrogate and um, as a big tea drinker, I would say this is one of the uh, my favourite days in the office. But after about two years of doing that, I was itching to get back on site, get back into technical engineering. So I applied for a secondment into our anaerobic digestion um, technical side and I worked at an anaerobic digestion site down in Surrey and uh, we it was a new site and my job was to support operations in moving it through the commissioning stage getting it signed off and getting into full operation I had never been involved with anaerobic digestion before um, but it was in, um, incredibly incredibly challenging but so rewarding when the site got signed off and we moved forward and it's still in operation today. After my secondment ended I moved I actually took three months out and I went to France uh, traveling uh, to learn to finesse my French understanding um, and I came back into Suez um, and now permanently in the technical team. So in my technical team role I support the uh, energy sites more energy from waste rather than anaerobic digestion so another process to learn um, and I've got a, the three photos at the bottom there that's a different aspects of what I've been doing so I get a lot of training in my role all about health, being health and safe being safe doing a job um, well but not only doing it safely physically but healthy mentally there's a lot of support around for that and um, we've got flue gas treatment and also on the right hand side we've got um, welders changing uh, air flows in one of our furnaces. Um, if you'd like to move on to the next slide please. Oh so the uh, why did I why resource management as I've touched upon I fell into this this sector by accident and um, it's got me hooked ever since. Waste is something with incredible value that we maybe just don't realise it. And I certainly beforehand, when I threw something in the bin, that's the last time I thought about it. And there is so much going on. This sector that I um, 
is developing and I was fortunate enough to uh, be selected to go on the X expedition which is an all, fam all female sailing team um, to look at different areas of the world and how our use of plastics and the occurrence of microplastics is affecting us, our ecosystems and also our health. And more recently, um, the uh, microplastics have been found in human blood. It shows the, the wider impact of what we are throwing away. Unfortunately, we were in COVID, so uh, much like the best laid plans, we had to uh, go online. So we got some virtual tours of the Arctic, and talking, including talking to indigenous communities and how their um, waste and relationship with disposable materials is changing as the environment around them is changing. And we, um, the re waste and resource management sector is is evolving at a very fast pace currently and we're really seeing a lot more interest in the uh, circular economy. I um, I have found that I am curious um, and I, as my passion is this area, um, I never want to stop learning and the circular economy course from the Ellen M MacArthur Foundation, which I did at the end of last year, um, I'm I found it incredibly useful, opening up my eye, um, my eyes and um, my comprehension of where the circular economy is and how it touch how it can touch and change our consumption patterns, patterns and models. Fundamentally, um, I the resource management sector to me is key to underpinning the green transition of every other sector, um, and I was lucky, fortunate enough to speak at Let's Recycle, which is a industry event about my plans and my hopes for the future of the sector. We, um, for those of you who are looking at developing or looking at maybe choosing a path at the moment, there is, I wanted to just point out the possibility of work in the waste and resource sector. And um, we have over the next, over up to 2030, it's forecast that there's going to be a five-fold growth in the waste sector with um, 130,000 employees in the UK alone today to over half a million. So there is going to be a huge demand for um, people with different skills, especially STEM skills. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so thank you for your time today. Um, my sort of key takeaways are, uh, in addition to all the great points that have been made already of talking about being curious is I want to just iterate don't put too much pressure on yourself if you don't know right now whatever your point your place is in your education or your career where you want to go or your plan I certainly didn't and I have just these the opportunities that have occurred in front of me or I have forged for myself and looked at an area that I've loved and it couldn't have worked out any better than it has, to be honest. Um, I'm delighted to be where I am and look forward to developing in the future. If you guys want to uh, reach out to me, I'm on social media, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to answer questions um, about um, sort of my career and so as. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Amy. OK, that was fantastic to hear from you. Okay, I'm going to ask you to stay on screen, please. And I'm going to ask our other two speakers to join us back again. And we'll uh, we'll be taking questions from our audience. So if you do have any questions, please do put them into the chat box. We've got about 10 minutes to ask some questions. So um, my first question from you all, actually, um, is do you feel that you had a wide choice of directions to choose from within engineering? So uh, Ruth, how about we start with you? Yeah, of course. Um, short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I think at university we were, so civil engineering is quite broad um, and we were shown all of the different pathways we could go down with that. Um, I think my placement has given me the opportunities and obviously these rotations since have given me very, very diverse uh, opportunities. And at school we were told all of the different types of engineering. Um, it was really highlighted that it's a very broad industry and there are maybe millions, I don't know, I've never counted, of different routes that you can go into. 
Oh, fantastic, thank you. Okay, the next question we've just had come in, um, I think is actually one very, very uh, suitable for Liz. So Liz, how has the RAF supported your career development? Have they helped to guide your career development or has it been your decisions as you move through your career? Um, so I think it's been a, probably a mixture of both. Um, so absolutely, if I've chosen to go a particular pathway, um, they've supported me in that. So everything, um, so like I said, I went and uh, taught, so facilitated master's education and um, the broader MOD, so Ministry of Defence, paid for me to be able to go and do a postgraduate certificate um, in, in education throughout my career they supported me in getting towards my charter engineer status um, so there's a pathway that they support you on to make that happen um, i've also been lucky to study uh, year-long masters and um, so really at every stage um, there is the option uh, for your education to be supported so whichever direction you choose to take uh, there's a course um, that you can use to support that uh, and, and certainly my experiences is, is it's and that's broader than just the RAF the armed forces um, definitely will support you in those choices brilliant thank you okay um, Amy I've got a question here for you um, what opportunities has your organisation given you so far that you really value? Oh gosh, wow, what a question. Um, the Suez has been incredibly supportive in how I've moved around the company and they've given me um, uh, support. So there's the Chartered Institute of Waste Management and the ICME, which is the Institute of Chemical Engineers, two, um, two professional institutions that I'm a member of. So Suez are supporting me at the time to become chartered, targeting my Chartered Institute of Waste Management this year. ICME is coming in the next couple of years and they're giving me the time aside to um, commit to pro continual professional development, which I think is really important because it's so easy to forget about that stuff, you know, focus on the day job, focus on getting everything ticked off your to-do list for that day. But um, Suez have really been supportive in that, in giving me the time aside to develop myself. Lovely, thank you. Okay, um, have we got any questions come in from the chat, Hannah? If not, I've, I've, so I can see a couple more, but I've there's a number of questions that have, that have come in uh, via the chat. Um, so a question for Ruth, uh, do you face sexism at work? Um, I've been very lucky in that by and large. No, I haven't. Um, there have been some things, you know, for example, I'm asked to take minutes at meetings, um, things like that, that are not sexism because I am the most junior in my team. So it's what would be expected of my role. Um, but yeah, mostly I've been very lucky in completely male dominated teams to be treated as an equal, even when I am also significantly younger than a lot of them. So It's maybe worth asking that of Liz and Amy as well, actually. Have you mm -hmm. faced any sexism in your career? So Liz, would you like to go first? Um, so again, I'd go no. Um, certainly, I'm valued for who I am, not the fact that I happen to be a woman. Um, I think probably what's more prevalent is what um, are, are sort of minor incivilities. So um, they'll often refer to the role of the chief engineer as he, even though I'm the female in the room and the chief air engineer. Um, so, but, but that's not out of any malice. Um, and, and it's really important that you call that out um, because um, people generally, it has always been a he. I was the first female um, chief air engineer at Bryson Norton. So um, not intentional. Um, and I wouldn't say even aggressive, we often refer them to as microaggressions. It, 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 that's not the case. It's just people perhaps not thinking um, that I would do it and, and not being, you know, minor incivilities is probably a really good way of putting it across. Yeah, potentially thinking about their actions and keeping that at the forefront of their mind at all times. Yeah, that unconscious bias rearing its head again. Yeah. Um, Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, similar to the uh, the other two ladies, no, nothing. I mean, microaggressions, maybe things that don't haven't even come on their radar yet that 
you know, they wouldn't even consider that they are being maybe, maybe sexist is a bit too strong, but it's not been that way before. And now, you know, times are changing, but, you know, I've never felt, um, I guess, threatened is um, a good word to use here. And people have always been very uh, very open if we want to talk about something. I would say that it's important that we look at, you know, diversity in the in a broader sense. There are many different ways that we need to increase diversity in, you know, STEM. And I've had some incredibly inspiring, uh, great female managers, but equally, I have a lot of um, male colleagues, male managers who are incredibly supportive, incredibly open-minded. I value me for me and what I can bring to the table um, rather than, you know, getting me on there because I'm a woman in engineering. Okay, I'm going to ask Hannah if we've got any more questions. And while I do that, I'm also going to ask Hannah to move on to the next slide, which should be a feedback form. And we'll leave that open while we're taking the next few questions. From we, we have a, we have uh, quite a few more questions, actually. Um, so what barriers have you faced being a woman working in a male dominated sector? If we go to Amy for that. Anything yet? Uh, I know I recognise your early career, but it would be interesting <laughs> if you found anything. Not a barrier, but it was a uh, challenge getting a coat that fitted me. I'm quite petite, I'm quite small, and getting a coat where the sleeves weren't like falling over my arms, that was a bit of a challenge to begin with. But we found a coat manufacturer, and, oh, who does it? So every day is a lesson, right? Hannah, have we got any other questions? Do you want to keep them coming while we're, because I can't see all the questions, so uh, just keep them coming and we'll, we'll address them as we've got another two or three. Yep. Another one was, uh, as many of these roles require a high level of education, how can people with limited financial resources pursue a career in engineering? Does anybody have anything they want to contribute to that? I'll open it up to the floor. Liz, go for it. <laughs> I was straight away. So um, I took a particular route. Uh, I happened to go to university and bearing in mind, I went through university quite a long time ago in comparison to our other two speakers. Um, so when there wasn't tuition fees in the same way that it is now. Um, but I just look at my husband. He left, uh, in, uh, sorry, he left school with zero GCSEs uh, and chose, he's also an uh, engineer in the Royal Air Force, same rank as me. Um, and actually the Air Force supported him through getting his HR uh, and he's a chartered engineer now so just there are many different routes open um, be that through apprentice schemes and um, joining as a non-commissioned officer in terms of the Royal Air Force but again that spreads across uh, the other services as well and equally the civil service so absolutely um, I was just quite blessed at the time that I went to university. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, so apprenticeship, apprenticeship schemes, keep an eye out for those companies that are offering those opportunities. Um, Can I just add something to that just quickly? Yeah, okay. I really agree with what Liz was saying, but I found just getting my foot in the door at the right company and once they see that you are. So I started in a very non-technical role, even though I'd you know, done degree but if they see that you are committed and want to learn I've got loads of colleagues who started out in very weird and wonderful places that they sort of did development plans with with Suez and now they are um, where they want to be if the company knows you want to develop if it's the right company they'll support you on that path I'm Great. sorry Claire just building on that one as well um, there are also scholarships um, so I'm going to do a shameless plug for the ICE uh, they do a quest scholarship where you get paired with a company and you get some money every year that you can use on whatever you want uh, be that towards tuition fees be that towards a nice holiday be that towards um, textbooks so that's also a really good opportunity Done now. there's some great advice and all of that OK, uh, Hannah, I think we've got time for one last question and then we'll close. There's only one left, actually. So um, why do you think big companies still push new engineers towards becoming chartered? Should we focus more on gaining real experiences instead? Oh, good question. OK, does anybody have anything they want to ask, answer there? Open up the floor again. Why, um, why do we I'm, uh, Sorry, go on. So that's that. Ruth? Yes. Yeah. So for me, chartership is still 
it kind of proves that you can actually apply what you've learned at university. University is generally quite theoretical, so or apprenticeships, you know, whichever route you choose to take. Um, it's also internationally recognised. Um, I don't know about the other speakers, but I have a master's in engineering that is not actually recognised in the US, for example, whereas chartership is. Um, on the second half of the question, I would maybe argue that in order to get chartered, you have to prove that you have that real experience. Um, again, not sure on the other institutions, but the ICE, there are a number of attributes that cover things from technical ability, sustainability, health and safety, and also communication. So it's not just those hard technical skills, but you can only achieve some of them by getting that rounded experience through being on site, through being in the office, uh, through working in a number of different roles and a number of different teams. Yeah, Liz, Amy, did you have anything? Yeah, Liz? I'd echo everything that we said there, and it goes back to the whole point of um, certainly, um, uh, so I'm Institute of Mechanical Engineers, chartered with them then, is to demonstrate application in your chosen field or profession. Uh, and likewise, um, the education, um, uh, whilst yes, in some cases, they ask for a, a particular degree, but you can demonstrate that in different ways. And I go, my husband's a really classic example. We are both en chartered engineers, and yet we have completely different educational backgrounds. And Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Just to add, I completely agree with what the other, uh, what Liz and Ruth have said. Um, but also for me, chartership is, almost a demonstration of your commitment to keep learning. You don't finish learning as soon as you become chartered. Um, there is, it's like there's a whole other world out there. And if you ever stop learning, in my opinion, that just should never happen. You should never stop learning. Like that would be boring. And that, I don't think any of us are here um, would agree that we want to be bored at work. <laughs> Definitely. OK, thank you so much to all three of you ladies today for joining us today and giving up your time to come on this webinar. It's been amazing. Uh, I've learned so much. I'm sure everybody else who's joined us has as well. We have recorded this webinar, so it will be available on the WISE website and we'll be promoting it over the coming weeks. So uh, thank you very much for your time today and uh, I'll bring the webinar to a close.